Welcome back to Birds of a Feather Talk Together. This week we were talking about the Northern Flicker. This super cool woodpecker was Amanda and my spark bird, so it's fun to learn all about them from John and Shannon. We hear about the red shafted and yellow shafted flickers in different parts of the continent and how they can hybridize as well. We also talk about whether or not woodpeckers can get CTE from banging their heads while pecking. We finish up with a mailbag question on the white-throated sparrow changing its call. It's a super fun episode, so go grab your binoculars and let's get into it. All right, well, welcome back to Birds of a Feather Talk Together. This is RJ, and I'm with John, Shannon, and Amanda. And I have a surprise for the three of you. Did you realize this is our 50th episode? No. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, apparently That's... I can't count to 50. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> 10,750 to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. That is so, awesome. So, yeah, Amanda and I wanted to talk about northern flickers on this because northern flickers was our, our spark bird. So, yes. jo- John and Shannon, you've opened our eyes to like so much with birds. And uh, I don't know, northern flicker kind of opened our eyes to get into birding in general. So, yeah. we haven't talked about it yet. So, I wanted to chat about it. Yeah. And so kind of what uh, the first thing that like really was eye opening for us, we were at the Botanic Gardens. This was like two years ago and saw a woodpecker that was on the ground eating bugs in the grass. And we didn't know what it was and we didn't have binoculars and went home and we're like, woodpeckers aren't in the grass. That's so weird. And so we Googled and it was like northern flicker. Yes. <laughs> and that was really the first time that we kind of recognize that like you could observe behavior to identify birds, which was, you know, a big turning point for anybody that is into birding. And before we just looked at like colors and shape and everything. And we were like, oh my gosh, you can, you know, different birds behave in different ways. That is such a important part to birding. So that was kind of our, uh, and then from there now, every time we see them, we're like, oh, it's our favorite. So yes. Yes. <laughs> we're excited to talk about them today. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a bird like that, John? Yeah, I'll have sighted flycatcher. Oh, come oh. on. You've got to get over that. <laughs> that, that what is that, John? That's this flycatcher <laughs> that I always say is my favorite bird that Shannon gives me grief for, but but it's... it's oh. Oh, it's so and, boring. It's, it's not a flicker. <laughs> so, I mean, I... You know, I, I'm always fascinated when we, we, we take out... We, we have this group of birds we call birds for touching, which are just specimens that were didn't have very good data, so they weren't scientifically valuable, but they're great with respect to showing people what a bird looks like and, and what, what they feel like so they, they can actually touch them. And, and, you know, even when people aren't clued into birds very much, you show them a flicker and they almost uniformly go, wow, that's a really spectacular bird. Is that around here? And, you know, as you guys saw when you were at the garden, not only are they around, when you see them, you're going to notice them. So they, they have this mm-hmm. kind of yeah. tan plumage, which is kind of slightly unusual for woodpeckers. Um, but then they have the black and white back, which is definitely woodpecker-like. And they have a stiff tail, which woodpeckers have. And, and you know, they do fours in the ground. Not as stiff as other species, yeah, though. But they, Their tails aren't as stiff but they, as other but they, species. But they still use it to prop up along the sides of trees at nest sites and things. And then... They're even more interesting in terms of coloration because they've got the uh, little red on the collar of the back of the neck, and and then males and females are differentiated by the the whisker mark in in uh, the various populations. But you know, given that you guys from are from the West or spent time out in the West, there's some really neat geographic variation in flickers in the sense that the, that there's a subspecies called or a couple of subspecies called. Uh, uh, yellow shafted flickers in the east, and they're replaced by what are called red shafted flickers in the west. And the the, the word shaft refers to the um, primary and secondary feathers and the tail feathers, which have these these carotenoids in them that, that make them look really different. So they can be red or yellow depending on where you are geographically. And it's a really unusual color combination. That that's not. The way that color is put into the feather, that's why they're so striking looking, the yellows and the reds like that. They're, you say their feathers are just really different. So if you were to pluck a, a feather, if you were to find a feather on the ground, you found one of those 
feathers, you would have no problems knowing that it came from a flicker. Some feathers are really hard and you need a lot of special expertise to figure out what it is, but that's not one of them. If you found a flicker feather on the, um, in the forest or in your yard, you know exactly what it is immediately. Yeah. When we were in Colorado, just, uh, month or so ago, we saw a red shafted flicker and we didn't even know that they were, that there was a separate subspecies. Amanda was like, I think that's a flicker. And I was like, it looks kind of different though. <laughs> and we went on to eBird and then we were like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So it was funny, like realizing that in real time, usually we try to research ahead of time, but I don't know. It's so nice having like eBird and Merlin to be able to figure yes. stuff out on the fly now. So this yeah. is something that's fascinated ornithologists for a long time, meaning the, the difference between red shafted and yellow shafted. And part of that is because they meet in the Great Plains and where they meet in the Great Plains, they, they, they hybridize. And, and so it was one of the first hybrid zones and, and part of it's just because they're so dramatically different with the red and yellow shafts that when you, you get intermediaries, you notice it because they turn out to be in between in terms of the coloration that gets uh at a varying shades of orange to yellow to red oh wow very depending cool. on very cool how many hybrid generations have have gone so huh and that's it's got to be the best studied hybrid zone in the world of birds i mean so there have been lots of studies for you know since ornithologists first started documenting what's happening because you can actually tell they're hybrids. Unlike some things that could hybridize, which you can't, you can't tell what a hybrid is. But in this case, you can see and measure the color and know kind of what the contributions of each side of this distribution might be producing. How many generations has it gone? You can measure things in ways you can't do with most, most taxa. And so is it a shade, a shade of orange or is it that there's some red feathers and some yellow feathers or what is the hybrid? Well, that's an interesting like. complexity. The answer is sort of yes. In other words, you you you, you sometimes <laughs> get both. you sometimes get both, and there's actually been some recent debate about what the source of all that could be in various situations. So, so these these flickers, you know, you you said you saw them on the ground, and and one of the interesting things about this is they're they're the genus that they're in, which is Calaptes, is a is are all birds that tend to forage on the ground. And they eat a lot of ants. That's one of the reasons why they're 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 down there. And and so um, there are a number of species. It's it's entirely new world. There are some old world uh, genera that do the same kind of thing. But in the new world, down into South America, you get other species that of of in the genus Calaptes that forage on the ground for for ants. Um, not not exclusively. They'll eat anything else. But but that's what they do. Um, but I was going to say that that. These the North American Calaptes, um, which is red shafted, yellow shafted, and then there's a third taxon called gilded flicker, have really flummoxed systematic ornithologists for a long time in terms of trying to treat them taxonomically. And this gets has to do with the, the genetic relationships. As Shannon said, they they're really well studied, and it turns out that so gilded flicker is a bird with yellow shafts. It, it lives in the deserts of the, of the Southwest. And when you look at it genetically, red shafted and yellow shafted, which hybridize extensively, are not each other's closest relatives. No, I think that's not do, true Do you anymore. think it's actually been over? Did Stephanie Aguilon's stuff change all that? Yeah. So there's this another young woman. So now we're into the young, young women rock science um, part of our <laughs> podcast series. But... <laughs> Uh, because the question is, how do they make these things? And there's been a lot of genetic work done uh, using mitochondrial DNA, and it wasn't clear. It was clear these things are all incredibly closely related, yellow-shafted, red-shafted, and gilded. Are they different species, different subspecies? What are they? What are their relationships? That, you know, data have shown varying forms of that. Sometimes the gilded flicker was nested within and other times it's not, and and this woman who um, is about to become a prof well a professor at Davis, UCLA. I guess. But anyway, she, UCLA. Oh, that's right. And she came out of Cornell with her PhD, and she took 
was the first person to kind of look at, at first she just looked at how different these things are. And it turns out they're incredibly similar. Like there's very, very few genome genetic differences between the yellow shafted and the red shafted ones. So, you know, that's interesting, potentially confusing. And then the questions turn to why are they different then? If there are so few genetic differences that you can't diagnose using genomic technique, you can't diagnose them from each other. And an initial genomic study um, didn't sequence whole, didn't sample whole genomes. And it showed that the yellow shafted and red shafted were each other's closest relatives with gilded just outside of them. Uh, and so that kind of helped understanding what the limits of some of these things are. But then she sampled whole genomes, trying to scan through the genome to look for places where these things actually differed. And, and it, it was a, only in a very few genes did red shafted and yellow shafted differ from each other. And in those areas are things having to do with uh, the same gene that controls canary color, whether you're a red canary or a yellow canary, that same set of genes that does that is the pl only place in the entire genomes where there are differences between the yellow shafted ones and the red shafted ones, which is really interesting. So there are just a few my mutations that, that make that those carotenoid deposition red or the carotenoid deposition yellow, which is really interesting to think that they could be so different looking, but almost not different at all. And there's just a few mutations and very small number of genes out of the, you know, tens of thousands of genes that these birds would have in them. So it's really, to me, it was really, it's a fun, it's a really fun thing that she that she found. Because the, once she finds that, you can start to understand what happens to hybrids. Are you adding things in hybrids or are you taking things away in the hybrids? And it turns out that there's these disruptions that happen um, in the deposition in hybrids uh, of the color. So it's not a blending in the sense that you get yellows and reds blending to make an, this orangey kind of Color, there's actually disruption in how the pigments get to positive produced. But there's also a, there's a neat thing you can do just by looking on eBird. If you know eBird separates data out by red and yellow shafted, you can you can put in the data that way. And if you look at the data for yellow shafted, um, you will see that they're that they're almost entirely in the eastern part of the U.S. and they get into the Great Plains, and that's about it. And then there are a few records in the West. If you look at, uh, I'm sorry, if you look at red shafted, sorry, yellow shafted goes all the way over to the West Coast fairly commonly, but red shafted actually doesn't cross over into the East very frequently, which I think is an interesting aspect of, of citizen science data that you can look at patterns that are really curious with respect to that. And you can only imagine how much the alterations in the landscape that's had across the middle of this country uh, have influenced the distributions, the ability of these things to move um, from one coast to another coast. Uh, yeah. You know, there's certainly been, but this, that hybrid zone's fairly stable, though, and fairly, fairly narrow compared to what you think it might be like. These things can clearly interbreed. It's not, um, you know, whether you're yellow or red doesn't influence it, although some of the things that may influence it is part of the color stories gets more complicated because there are variants in the black producing parts, like these melanin genes, that also play a role in how um, the carotenoid color is deposited. And that's like, that's not supposed to happen. So, and I don't know that we need even understand exactly how a variation in a melanin gene is producing these other colors that are carotenoid based pigments. So it's really, it's a very, an interesting story that's happening with relatively few mutations across the entire genome. So one mutation can make a really big difference. Not that many mutations produce the high elevation oxygen um, for hemoglobin uh, affinities either. So those are relatively few mutations. You don't have to change every part of a gene to change its function. So there's lots of really good stories that can be told about uh, about 
woodpeckers, even though all woodpeckers peck to some degree, and um, certainly people have been annoyed by flickers because of what they do when they're trying to mate, which is like smack their head on things that have loud resonance, like people's tin roofs, for example. And you no, know, wait, can so be they really... do that to attract a mate? They do. Oh, yeah. I didn't but realize they that. don't peck to they don't peck to go in and get their food out of the middle of trees the way some woodpeckers do. So they're even though they're spending a lot of time making noise to try to attract a mate, they're not doing that to feed per se, not so much. They might be excavating holes to dig in. Uh, and they're really important for that, really important for other birds, for example, that will use uh, the holes that um flickers have excavated to do things things, but so we had uh, some researchers when the injuries to football players became so known, the brain injuries to football players became known. The question then these researchers in Boston had was, well, what happens to what happens to woodpeckers, woodpeckers. right? Do they oh, have yeah. the same brain morphologies that birds that humans do, who have either have Alzheimer's disease or have had their head hit too much by playing um, sports? And so they asked for window kill birds so that they could slice through their brains and use imaging technology and special staining processes that would stain these proteins that get all tangled in people's brains. They're called tau proteins, for example. And the tau protein usually keeps your neurons all nice and lined up. Uh, and when they're damaged, they don't. And so your neurons form these classic tangles that you see in the brains of people. A lot of football players have donated their brains to science so that they can understand what's happening inside of their brains because this, this is a devastating thing to happen to you. It causes a lot of behavioral things. It shortens your life. There's high incidence of suicides, memory loss, um, behavioral inhibition happens, you know, so there can be rage and violence and people can't understand their behavior. It's a horrible thing to happen and so they've donated their brains so that you can understand what the morphology inside of a brain that has these problems looks like. Because we don't have any other good ways of testing for that. Well, we haven't historically. It's getting better. And then, so they asked for woodpeckers to see, well, what happens to woodpeckers that peck? Surely, uh, you know, how can this evolve if you peck your brain into oblivion? Um, and so we gave them downy woodpecker, and they also have fur and turns out that downy woodpeckers do have these tangles, but not very many. So oh, wow. there's, um, there's evidence of that morphology in their, in their brains, but that's not true of flickers. Flickers did not have these tangles. I mean, not that they might not have it because there wasn't, this wasn't a huge study sample size or anything like that. So woodpeckers have the ability to ameliorate these effects on their brain. How do they do that? We don't, we don't know, but there's certainly a correlation between the amount of time you spend smashing your head against a tree and whether you have these tangled aspects of your brain. So there's way more interesting things that happen than you even would ever think. So these, this idea that you can find solutions to human problems in nature, I think, is a really important. Is really important, and the communities don't talk very much. The medical community doesn't talk very much to the evolutionary biology community. <laughs> And it's at the detriment of both of these these areas of science that we're not better integrated. And COVID showed us that really dramatically, the importance of animal studies to understand what's happening to people and the fact that humans are connected to the rest of life on Earth. Um, and there's a lot of things that have happened in humans that we need to know more about, too, that have to do with diseases or other ways of doing science. So. Um, so I can't think of woodpeckers without thinking of how important these connections can be, should be, and need to be into the future. Do you think what they're, I mean, this is totally a out there question, but what they're banging on has a difference on whether or not they could get CTE if you're pecking into wood versus into metal or something, you know, wood is going to be more forgiving. I wonder if... Uh, that could impact I, I, it. I think with flickers, a lot of times they're looking for uh, nest holes that, that either already exist or, or fairly rotted wood that's fairly soft that they can get into. And and 
and yet at the same time, I've, I've seen wood uh, flickers nesting in the Chicago area in telephone poles, which by definition are as hard as you can get. And so they've clearly got some capacity to deal with pretty hard wood sometimes. There's a lot of variance in nature too. So why are woodpeckers resilient to repeated smashing of their heads? And I, and I think that this is one of the things that made studying kingfishers so enticing to me. And we're going to have some episodes on kingfishers eventually, and we'll talk about this in more detail. But there's a lot of lessons to learn from bio in bioengineering to solve human problems. And kingfishers have done a lot, are, I think, are good models for a lot of that. I think we should all eat ants like flickers. No, <laughs> I don't think we should all eat ants like flickers. But, you know, flickers are so pretty. Do they have a pretty, like, specialized tongue for eating ants then? So, you know, coming back to what Shannon was saying, I mean, their bill is interesting compared to woodpeckers in, in that it tends to be less chisel-like than, than, uh, than downy and hairy woodpecker do. And so they do have the same tongue that woodpeckers have, which is so interesting in the sense that the it's just like hummingbirds where and in, independently evolved in the two groups where the connections actually come through the nostrils go up over the head and allow the tongue to actually stick out beyond the tip of the bill and and i was mentioning this before we started today that, that just serendipitously there were two flickers a male and a female in the backyard yesterday and i was watching them forage along the edge of our yard where we definitely have ants. And it looked to me like they were actually kind of pecking as opposed to actually sticking their tongue out and grabbing them. And I need to go back and look at some high-speed videography to figure out what's going on there. But I could imagine it being either way um, for them getting ants. And yet at the same time, they do have this capacity. And, and the other thing is woodpecker tongues have these barbs on them. And that allows downy and hairy woodpeckers to go into a uh, bark and get inside and grab grubs and actually kind of cook them and pull them out. And I don't know whether flickers do that quite as much as, as these other species. We've had some ants in our house. Maybe we should have pet flickers. Oh, that's true. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not very happy with the ants in the house, frankly. So another <laughs> fun thing about, about flickers is they're migratory. And we have a few flickers that hang out in Chicago through the winter, but then every spring and fall, uh, they migrate through. And I always like to point that out to people because if you go to places uh, like parks and cemeteries um, in the right day on spring, you can see 10 to sometimes even 20 flickers in a fairly small area as they're, to get, you know, as they're moving through Chicago on their way further north. And so they're they're just a really noticeable bird when they're around, and you flush them up. And the other thing we haven't mentioned is, I always like to say, gist wise, they're they're really identifiable for folks, and then people notice them because they have a white rump too. So when they're flying away, you 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 definitely get this flash of white that you don't get in a lot of other birds. Yeah, there's we see a lot of them up in Fort Sheridan, and we see them in groups. Yeah, so there's this spot in Fort Sheridan that we go to, and it's like off the trail. There's this little lookout where you can look down in the ravine, and there's this big, like, dead tree there. And every time we go there, we see a bunch of flickers, and we'll see, I don't know, four or five of them. And it's, I don't know, that's really the only place that we've seen them in groups. We kind of see them isolated a lot of times. So every time we get there, we get really excited because it seems like there's, we, we couldn't tell if it's like a family, if it's a mom and some young that she's teaching them or... But it's it's every time we go there, we see a group. I, and it's I really could cool. imagine that that could be uh, adults and offspring, and and that they're they're mm. they're together okay. because of that. So clutch size, I think, is four okay. or so in in flickers, and and yeah. So you get these family groups this time of year, in particular. I was wondering whether this pair that I saw yesterday may have failed in their first breeding attempt, and they were actually around this morning too, and so. I was thinking maybe they'll find a, another nest site and potentially try again one more time this year, oh. which would be kind of neat. Oh. That's that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. There have been some r other really cool studies that have been done on flickers. And because there's a lot of variation in the shade of red and the deposition of carotenoid pigments, and 
there's a lot of interesting things about how they make color, but there have been really cool studies done on whether or not the intensity of the red is an indicator of the quality of a male. Um, and that's interesting too. What are you signaling with your color? Are you an honest signaler of your quality? Uh, and it turns out that, that a lot of studies have been done like that in, in, in flickers because there is variation in, in, in the red, the amount of red. And we can track that because humans can see red pretty well. If they have variation in other colors that we can't see, well, we're not going to be so good at that. But so there is data now to show that the intensity of the male is a signifier of the quality of the mate. So if you're a female bird, you know, picking a, a male that has a more intense red is an indication of their quality. You know, and it also has parts of other parts, like the, the stripe that comes out of the side of their mouth and how big it is, is another indicator of the quality of the of the male, because that's something that distinguishes males from females, the presence mm. of that, of that stripe out of the side of their, their mouth. So if it's darker, apparently you get, you can get, and then if your bib is darker, you are, you lay eggs earlier if you're a female, mm. um, you lay more eggs and you have larger clutches of fledglings. So, so how do you think they disentangle so, that? There's some indication How do you think that. they disentangle that from mm. the actual age of the female? Females, as they get older, get darker, and 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 older females breed earlier than I don't know. I'm just this is I'm always interested in these studies from the perspective well, of how do you age woodpeckers? I'm sure there's some data on it from yeah. I mean that I don't know what the role experience might play in that. That's a good good point. I don't I don't know. Well, you know how you would know. You would go into collections and line them all up and figure out the age of them and see whether or not there is or how strong a correlation might be between the intensity of the color, the width of the stripes or whatever. You know, there's ways you could study that. So so there's, um, there's actually a publication out there that, that I always find incredibly amazing. And it's this, this work by a guy named Peter Pyle, who's uh, painstakingly done what Shannon's talking about for most species of North American birds and actually gone through ways in which you could potentially age them if you can. And so the, he's got the, he'll have a section on Northern Flicker where he'll provide whatever information there is about what you can do with respect to aging them. Certainly the juveniles look different uh -huh. than, than the adults, but I wouldn't say there's a lot of, I, I, huh. visually I don't think of being able to see much variation in, in, uh, in adult birds. Uh, I mean, if you when you look through accounts of birds, there's a whole bunch of words that go along with the description of feathers, molting feathers. It's like it's got its whole, a whole different language. And I, it, it's yeah. really can, even for me, I'm like, okay, now what does that word mean again? And what is the direction of things? Like, where? If we go back to giant hummingbirds. They molt, they don't molt all their white feathers at the same time. So they molt some of them, then they migrate, then they molt the rest of them. So there are so many different ways in which you can molt feathers that, and there's a whole, a whole language associated with how you describe. There's all these acronyms and all these letters uh, that describe the age of birds. And it's very confusing. And that's a place that's really ripe for illustration and kind of taking it down several notches, these descriptions of, of molting. Anyways, maybe it's just because it makes me feel stupid. <laughs> on, on the subject of feathers, I, one of the things I wanted to talk about for flickers was like the spots that they have on their belly. I always thought those are like so pretty and are they like, how do feathers develop spots? Like that seems like such a unique thing. And I, I don't know, that's really, is it one feather that has a spot on it or is it like half a spot on one feather, half a spot on the other? And they, I mean, it's, I don't know. <laughs> I think it depends on the situation and, and, and that's where patterning in birds. And, and again, that's another feature of flickers that I think really draws people in is just how beautiful that is. I want to say that is, uh, potentially single feathers, but I could be wrong about that. 
but certainly wing bars and stuff aren't, um, are, and, and white and black barring on the backs, they're multiple feathers. Some birds mm -hmm. do that. Woodpeckers make black and white patterns. They do. Um, that's so and Some birds don't so do cool. that. Yeah. Uh, they make different kinds of patterns, whether it's a different kind of color or something else. So there are groups that just do certain things. I mean, kingfishers make colors in every single conceivable way. Um, woodpeckers specialize in making black and white barrings. There's whole groups of birds that are really cool behaviorally and genomically that are dull brown things that vary in the degree of of wing patterning that's usually buffy colored or white or off-white colors or whole groups of birds that vary like that i don't think we necessarily know how that happens through evolutionary time frame like why woodpeckers can do some things that that hummingbirds don't do for example I don't know. It's really cool. That means there's just more to learn, right? We don't know how all of colors. Yeah. We certainly don't know nearly enough about pattern, which have to do with when and how pigments and the pigment producing thing containers are put into the feathers as they develop. Mm. Um, and, and that has to do with gene expression. And it, we don't know very much about that stuff yet. They know a lot about it in chickens, I guess, because people have made chickens with all different kinds of things. But that doesn't mean we know how a non-highly manipulated uh, bird by humans. We don't necessarily know how evolution produced those things. Well, we know how humans and, can and, make and it. Then you look at pigeons these, and chickens. These perceptions of patterns are so interesting. So I think one of the reasons why people notice the spots on flickers is because there aren't a whole lot of other groups of birds that you can come up with where there's spotting like that. And so is that something really special or is it just a variation like Shannon was saying on a, on a, on an overall theme and with genomic tools, you can begin to, to look at that and it'll be interesting to see what some of the answers are. Well, I think that might be a good place to call it. We're getting close on time. Um, we do have a mailbag question I was going to get to real quick. So this is from Claire G. from British Columbia. She said, I just came back from a hike with some birders in Smithers, B.C. They said that the white-throated sparrow changed its call. Do you know much about this? Have you done an episode on this? Ooh. No, but it reminded me we really need to do an episode about, about these sparrows because they're not just interesting in a call-wise, but they're, they have no end of really interesting things that have happened that they expressed. But yeah, there was, I don't know, in the 90s, I guess, well, it was before the 90s, they they started singing differently in, in and around where she was hiking. They kind of truncated part of their sound and, uh, and that spread, so you know, because songs are learned from songbirds. Um, it's not like you can learn a completely different sound, so you're not going to learn a penguin sound if you're a warbler. That doesn't happen. But if you get variations on the theme of your own species' song, that novelty can be very attractive. And, and if females are choosing males based on these sounds, or if there's inter... inter um, if there's competition competition between males and those songs sounds are part of it, that just spread. And they spread very widely, fast. And, and they're not the first bird to do that, which is I find really interesting too. There's lots of birds that we can talk about that have, you know, really created sound dialects, which is what a lot of people call these things um, in other parts of of the world. It's really interesting. And it's, it's, it's a between sex interaction too. So in theory, it spreads because if males are singing in a different way and females like it, they're more likely to mate with females that, that are with males that, that sing different, the, the new dialect. And so that's how it actually presumably gets established across an entire population. And so but they haven't produced birds of paradise yet. Don't get, don't go crazy. I mean, these sounds, <laughs> these songs are not that different. Well, and, and as you know, um, what 
but you could hear it. I mean, huh. yeah, beauty's well, cool. in the we eye of the beholder. Whole, I suppose. Whole episode on, yeah. No, we should definitely do a whole episode on on the white throated on white throated yeah. sparrows, for sure. Yeah. Because I mean, I think it's the bird we have the most of in our collections. Could oh, be. Wow. If no, upwards of. And that's the that's one cool. where I said we pulled out. Um, oh. All of them. Oh. We have. Well, at that time we had twelve thousand. We probably have fifteen thousand of them. I don't even want to see. Think about how many might be in the freezer, but um, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of really cool studies that have been done and that could be done. Good question. Very cool. Yeah. And hello yeah. from Thank you, someone Claire. who grew up in British Columbia too. Mithers, BC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Shannon, you've got a fan club up there. <laughs> I wonder how how did she find us? Um, she reached out on Instagram. So she found so us. I'm not through... sure. Through social media? I'm not sure how she found us, but that's how she submitted her uh, question. So Cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate the support. Please make sure to hit the subscribe button in your podcast app so you always get our newest episodes when they're released. Also, thanks, everyone, for leaving us a rating and review on the podcast app. We really appreciate it. If you have a question for us, please reach out to podcast.birdsofafeather at gmail.com. See you all next week. Love you all. Each and every one of you. Thanks for listening.